Johnny Johnson, fighter pilot. That's what it's all about. And uh, who joined the, the, Royal Air Force, or the Royal Air Force Volunteer Reserve before the war, and then the Royal Air Force... Uh, and then the Royal Air Force uh, uh, at the beginning of the war, uh, fought at the back end of the Battle of Britain, and then fought continuously with only six months rest through the whole of the Second World War. And that wasn't the end of it, because thereafter he served with great distinction in the post-war years, having been a fighter pilot in uh, Korea, as uh, with the Americans, and, uh, and then with great distinction thereafter having retired in the mid-60s. Tonight he is going to talk about leadership in the fighter arm, and I know he's going to talk about all sides of, uh, of fighter command, uh, including Normandy and North Africa. Tactical Air Forces. Tactical, tactical Air, Air Forces, and we very much look forward to what you have to say, sir. Thank you, Phil. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I think, first of all, gentlemen, I must tell you how I became a fighter pilot. And that was uh, in the, the 1939, I was a member of the Royal Air Force Volunteer Reserve, uh, where it wasn't quite as exclusive as the Auxiliary Air Force. And we were, certainly, we were sort of uh, flying uh, training centers, and one had to go to night school. Uh, if you didn't go to night school, you didn't get your flying. Uh, you, didn't, you weren't allowed to fly. And anyway, we were all called up, all 5,000 of us, on the 3rd of uh, September 1939, and for uh, our sins, uh, the, the, the uh, most of us from my centre were sent to uh, Jesus College at Cambridge, and some to St John's to cool our heels until the flying schools could absorb us into the uh, system. And after being there about two months, uh, we were all paraded one day, and we had a gun in front of a wing commander and two old squadron leaders who sat there in the Great Hall of Trinity or something. And we were all marched up and we were asked what we wanted to be. And they'd be about, I would think there would be about five or six hundred people in my particular group being interviewed by these people and they all wanted to be fighter pilots for some reason or other. And uh, so I thought, uh, that, and as they came up, as they came up in the queue, uh, the old wing commander, so, so, the chairman of the selection committees, said another bloody fighter pilot, I suppose. He'd obviously had a very good lunch, another fighter pilot, and that sort of thing. When it was my turn, and, uh, he, uh, and the Jays, I was about halfway through the queue, and he said, well, I suppose you've got another fighter pilot here, have we? I said, well, as a matter of fact, we haven't, sir. I said, I'd like to be a reconnaissance pilot. And he said, oh, and he, I immediately had their attention, so it was a very important thing in the... Uh, <laughs> selection process and, all that. and uh, he said what makes you think uh, young man that uh, you would make a reconnaissance pilot well I said I am a surveyor by profession so I know something about the uh, topography of the land contours surveyor and I thought that might be a bit useful as a reconnaissance put him down as a reconnaissance pilot he said put his name down as a reconnaissance that's how I became a fighter pilot <laughs> well, <that is. coughs> We're going to talk about leadership this evening, as I saw it in the <clears throat> Second War. My definition, uh, definition of leadership is, uh, is the, the leader. I think the first quality is integrity. I think that is once the integrity, you can say that's part of character, once a man flaws in his integrity, he's lost. Once he's suspective of this or that and he's not 100%, he's gone. Integrity. Moral courage, uh, very important, as displayed by Dowding in the Battle of Britain and other commanders. And the third and uh, last one for me is professional knowledge. I think the commander, up to the commander in chief uh, uh, a level, has got to have the professional knowledge, and especially, I think, more important today to discuss the and have an intimate knowledge of the arms in which his uh, people are using. So let us then take ourselves back to my days as a young man before the war when we had uh, the uh, German Air Force uh, being uh, tried out uh, in Spain uh, in the Condor Legion and we had uh, 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 
our friend Mulder's down there. I think we've got a member of the Mulder squad in here. Uh, I'm also an uh, honorary member of the uh, German Fighter Pilots Association I told you before dinner. Uh, and we had uh, my old friend uh, Galland, who I was, I was out in uh, Washington with him just a, uh, three or four weeks ago. He was down there in Spain, and they got their, they got their act right, you know, uh, the Germans down in, the, in Spain with the Condor Legion. And they got the, they proved the 109, they proved the Stuka, the dive bomber, which was to terrorize Europe later on. And they also, under a man called uh, Richthofen, von Richthofen, a relative of the uh, Red Baron himself, the, uh, they got the Air Ground Act together. They were the first uh, people in the world to get the Air Ground uh, team together in the Spanish Civil War, integration of the Army and the Air Force. And uh, then they came back uh, in, I think it was 38, and... Uh, 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 studied these lessons of the Condor Legion and developed their air force which uh, turned out to be really a big tactical air force with in 1939 40 with not too much emphasis on the strategic air force and we may as we develop this uh, talk this evening uh, we may think that uh, you know, they weren't very far uh, wrong at the time with the, 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 the lack of the strategic air force and concentrating on the tactical air forces, as it were. Meanwhile, uh, Fighter Command, uh, what were we doing in 1938-39? We, uh, uh, we had some bloody awful tactics. We had the textbook tactics of uh, the Fighter Command, that was one to six attacks. And I was looking at my logbook the other day, I was writing a piece for a new book, which I hope you'll all buy, buy in due course. <laughs> you never mentioned the last one, did you? No, I was it on And I was uh, uh, writing a piece, and that's the thing, that on September the 15th, in my logbook, and I was flying with the 616 uh, South Yorkshire Squadron from a place called Curtin in Lindsay, and we were a reserve squadron not too far from the battle, the 616 had been badly uh, uh, cut up, lost a lot of people, and we practiced on, fifth, on the 15th of September 1940, fighter command attack number five, and my squadron commander, I was flying on his right hand side, and he said, Johnson, and no, a no, red two, get your wing inside mine so we can bring all the guns to bear when we turn off and do fighter command uh, attack, that sort of thing. That was in September of 1940, the day, the greatest day of the Battle of Britain, that's the thing, when we sort of, uh, all the squadrons uh, down in the south were fighting hard, and the Luftwaffe had got the rot and the swarm and the open formation, and we were so far behind them in fighter tactics. Uh, uh, but we had the radar, uh, which they didn't have, and we had some very good men in fighter command from the old uh, uh, empire or whatever you might call the old dominions the like of which i have never seen and shall probably never see again we had uh, people like jameson and uh, wells from uh, and gray from new zealand and we had the great uh, sailor milan and uh, dutch hugo from south africa and Stan Turner from Canada and that's thing. All these chaps who had been attracted by the Short Service Commission to come over here and fly and fight for the old country, uh, which in those days uh, meant something to him. So what I'm really saying is we had some excellent men, just as the Luftwaffe themselves had some excellent men down in Spain and the people like Mulders and Galland and Vic and those sort of chaps. Uh, <coughs> And so then the next, uh, the, the, uh, the, the beginning of the really serious business was the Blitzkrieg in the West, and which uh, there was a code name for it. I think it was devised by von Manstein called Schickelsmeet. Does that mean anything to you? Schickelsmeet. Well, it means the cut of the sickle. No. Well, that's what I'm told is. <laughs> And that was the name for the for that was the name for the the, the code name uh, Schickelsmith for the sickle. 
reaping. For the unleashing of the German armour uh, supported by the tactical air forces and the Stukas and the 109s as they swept through the Low Countries, Holland, Belgium, France, in, starting in May of 1940. And a friend of mine, who, well, he's, he's a friend of mine now, he's much senior to me, and he, he, his name is Air Chief Marshal Sir Harry Broadhurst. As a young man then, he went out to take over a wing at a place called Vitry as the Germans were coming through France, and he said, there, we just, there was nothing. There was, uh, in the midst of May 1940, there was no communications, no command structure, no leadership, which we're talking about this evening, nothing. He said the whole thing was an absolute bloody shambles. And I said, well, what did you do with the Hurricane Squadrons? And he said, well, we just flew and took off in the general direction of the battle. But there was no army uh, uh, air ground uh, training, nothing at all. And as they fell back from airfield to airfield, as the Germans were coming down in those sort of frantic days, and this is an absolutely true story, uh, they, uh, one squadron of Hurricanes got to somewhere in France and there was a French pilot practicing aerobatics at about three or 4,000 feet in his little monoplane Moran or something like other, doing loop in the loop and so on and so forth. And at the same time that he was practicing the aerobatics, a Dornier 217 flew over at the same height, taking photographs and so on. And the English flight commander rushed up to the French controller and said, for Christ's sake, tell him to look round to the starboard, and you'll see the uh, Dornier, the pen to twin engine uh, and twin fuselage thing fly along, and tell him to hack it down. He said, Mon Capitaine, it is not possible. You see, he is only authorised a day for aerobatics. <laughs> <laughs> true story, true story, that. And so that on the 19th of May, gentlemen, then we see the War Cabinet meeting and discussing the, on the 19th of May, the evacuation from France of a considerable number of men. An operation, I think it was, uh, I think it was Operation uh, uh, Dynamo, uh, which uh, eventually succeeded when we were cornered with the British Expeditionary Force and 20 French divisions in the, what they call the canal line. And according to my researches, there's been a lot of tr talk about the miracle of Dunkirk. There was no, there's no very many miracles in war as we know really. But on the 23rd of May, von Rundstedt, who was commanding his group of armies, and when the British and the French divisions, as I've said, were in, uh, enclosed, trapped within this uh, canal, uh, what they call the le uh, canal line, on the 23rd of May, he issued a stop order in order to find out if some of the armies were, some of his armies were intermingling with others and to sort the, uh, the thing out to issue boundary alert lines and to get his force together as a cohesive force after the great advance uh, 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 to the south. And so that was, a, that was a stop order, which was really a, a, a regrouping order. And Hitler agreed with that. There's uh, documentation to say that uh, Hitler agreed with that. And on the 27th of May, uh, uh, three days later, then Hitler ordered the attack, Ronsted to attack uh, the British and French forces. But by then, they'd had the opportunity and most of them were away. And there was a man, there was a panzer uh, uh, leader in uh, uh, Rundstedt's organization called von Kleist. And he met the Fuhrer at Cambria Air For uh, uh, Airfield uh, uh, some days after Dunkirk. And he said to him, a great opportunity uh, was lost of driving the British into the sea. And Hitler replied, that may be so, but I did not want to send the tanks, he said, into the Flanders marshes. And you remember that he'd been an infantryman in the First War. I did not say, want to send the tanks into the Flanders marshes, and the Brits won't, the British won't come back in this war. 
So I think that those are the facts. That was the myth and so on and so forth that got the men uh, a, a third of a million away, a, man, a third of a million men away. There's never been any parallel like it in the history of warfare that I can find that uh, uh, from a half-destroyed harbour and beaches constantly uh, shelled and strafed uh, uh, in the face of the world's, at the time, the world's greatest army and air force. And I think, uh, there's, uh, I think the credit and the honours must go to the Royal Navy. I think there was a man called Vice Admiral Ramsey down at, uh, at, uh, uh, at Dover who, as I've said on the uh, early in May, was uh, told to organise things. He organised 765 ships that brought those men away. A tremendous feat in, the, in those of organisation and... Uh, 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 and command, really. And uh, I think the, th the second thing was the discipline on the beaches of the British troops who obeyed orders and so on. And third, the fighter cover provided by uh, uh, 11 Group under Keith Park, which was minimal, but uh, uh, just adequate. Uh, uh, Dunkirk. Uh, well, we've all... Uh, had and you all talked about the 50th anniversary of the Battle of Britain uh, this year. And Phil, you tell me that you've had the uh, fire, the, power, the Battle of Britain Association and German people here, and so on and so forth. Uh, so we won't go into that in the tremendous detail. I have always held uh, in my writings and talks and that sort of thing that the Germans had the force and the wherewithal and the training and the tactics and the numbers to have won the Battle of Britain if they'd have set about it the right way. Now, okay, the, uh, the Hitler's, uh, uh, he may have he had his eyes on the south of France and so on and so forth. But I remember going around the south of England when I was a young man and sort of seeing the Home Guard uh, and the British Army bereft of weapons and tanks and nothing and so on. And if you'd have, if the Germans had come down there, and if Goering, who was not a professional, as Dowding was a professional, here again we come to leadership, if they surely had have taken out the radars, uh, the eyes of fighter command, which gave Dowding the ability to keep his force at readiness, if they'd have taken out the 14 radar stations, ranging from the Wash to the Isle of Wight with their Stukas, which was a pinpoint weapon and could deliver a bomb within 30 or 35 yards. Surely those radar stations sticking up like saw pricks all round the th coast at 300 feet, if they'd have come over and pulled up and taken those out, as they'd taken out the bridges over the Meuse and the communications and the, and the, and the, and the thing that they came down uh, through the Low Countries and France, then we would have been uh, very hard-pressed. And if the 109s had come over at low level, uh, and the bombers had come over at low level without any radar, and strafing our front airfields and communications, <coughs> and had the picked and aggressive and highly trained German paratroopers dropped and seized the bridgehead in Kent or Surrey, <coughs> then, gentlemen, I think we would have been very hardly pressed indeed. As it was, it was a very narrow margin, and the Germans did all the things wrong. They didn't maintain the aim. They didn't concentrate against this and that. They switched when they had us reeling, and the communications had gone, and we fighter command was a waste in command because it was losing 125 experienced pilots a week being replaced with 65 inexperienced pilots a week. Uh, we were a waste in organisation until they switched from the changed <coughs> their strategy, didn't maintain the aim and went for London in retaliation for a small attack on Berlin which saved the day. I was then a very new boy. I joined 19th Squadron about the middle of August 
they were at Duxford, and I remember the squadron leader sending for me, and he said, how many hours have you got on Spitfire? There were three of us. There was myself, a chap called Forsyth, and another guy. And he said, how many hours have you got? And I said, 11.50, 12, uh, 10. He said, well, I don't know. What are we going to do with you? We can't train you here, and so on, so you just have to hang about. Uh, so we hung about, and I went to see the adjutant, and I said, do you know anything to do? He said, yeah. He said, you can go and get me half a dozen razor blades, old boy, in Cambridge, if you wouldn't mind, you know, take my car and so on. So those were the days, really, and <laughs> uh, uh, no time for training, because uh, the squadron commander was killed the next day. One of his flight commanders went, they had uh, 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 20 millimeter, they were the first squadron in the Royal Air Force to have cannon. They had two 20 millimeter cannon, and they didn't work. Every time the chaps got... In, on the back of a German airplane, they had uh, one shell, a 120 mm out, or two, and the cannon seized up. And they were very frustrated, as you can imagine, uh, after manoeuvring and seeing their comrades shot and that sort of thing, uh, not to be able to fire. And the, and, the, and, the, and the difficulty was reported to the station commander, Woodall, to the group commander, Lee Mallory, to the commander-in-chief, the self, the great man himself, Dowding. And I happened to be there at Duxford when Dowding came up to see the squadron leader whose name <coughs> just escaped me no Sandy Lane that's right the first one had gone this was Sandy Lane and he came up in a little Proctor airplane with a group captain armament I suppose he'd be and they stood around there the tall aloof Danish looking commander in chief with the fate of the world hanging on his shoulders although I don't suppose he knew it at the moment and Lane stood in front of the Spitfire, and I hung around the side. So, and I heard the Commander-in-Chief say, now, squadron leader, he said, tell me, what is wrong with your cannon? And the group captain, the middle of the staff officer, jumped up, and he said, well, sir, he said, uh, <clears throat> of course, if the armourers knew their job, or something like that, uh, if they'd been properly trained, or oh, over properly trained, when, uh, uh, they'd go, they, they, the cannon would, would fire, and so on and so forth. And he said, thank you, group captain, I would like to hear what the squadron leader has to say. So the bloody group captain went in again, you see, the staff officer, and Dowdin shut him up, very courteously. But it was a great, really, wasn't it? It was a great, uh, I, don't, I don't suppose I realised at the time, there was the commander-in-chief, he was talking to one of his squadron commanders, the chain of command. The group commander wasn't there, but that didn't matter. But that was the chain of command. From Dowding to this, he wanted to hear what the squadron commander, the staff, were there to advise and shut up. They don't interfere with the chain of command. So there were two things there, weren't there? There was the chain of command, and there was the leadership. That in all this time of all the stress, the great man had time to come up and talk to a squadron leader uh, to find out what was wrong with his 20 metre cannon. They went that day and were replaced with uh, the old uh, uh, eight gun uh, Spitfires. Uh, so, uh, I think I'm not going to go into the Battle of Britain any more than that. Uh, I think uh, we it was won largely by. German mistakes. I think they could have won it, as I've said. We did have the leadership, and we did have some very great uh, chaps at, in the squadron, at the squadron level, fighting for us. I think such a diverse uh, medley of men as would, I don't know whether we'd ever see them again, or whether they were seen before. They were the they were the Empire chaps, they were our own arch, they were the reservists, they were the auxiliaries. There were Czechs and there were Poles. They would fought with three air forces as Europe fell and had little else to uh, lose as they fought with us. And then there was the odd Frenchman and the odd uh, seven or eight Americans and so on. Very diverse uh, group of people. And I think as the days of September, as the, 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 when the bombing was switched, then they scented the victory. And like a really a pack of hounds, if you like, they scented that they could hold. If they couldn't win, at least they could hold uh, uh, the fort, the island home. And their morale 
was tremendous. I have never, ever seen anything like it, and I've been around a bit in various wars. I've never seen anything like the morale of those fighter squadrons and the people in it at that time, except for one occasion when I left 19th Squadron and then I went to join 616 Squadron and they'd been hammered and lost half their uh, chaps down at Kenley. They were badly led uh, and uh, were demoralised. But they got a man, uh, they got a good CO who had him right in a matter of days. He was a man called Billy Burton. He was a Cranwell man, sword of honour, leadership again. Soon as the, they had to get rid of the old CO, was useless. They brought Burton in and he had the squadron right in uh, a matter of two or three days, except for his tactics when he told me to put his bloody my wing inside his, but still. Uh, I think one of the greatest, uh, I remember as a small boy, not a small boy, but as a pilot officer, I remember picking up in 1941 an operation, uh, it was lying, the sea I'd left it uh, uh, on his desk, something or other, in this first, and I picked it up, and it was called Operation Fuller, top secret, it said. And it said, uh, uh, action to be taken uh, if the German warships, whenever the German warships, the Scharnhorst, uh, the Prinz Eigen, and the uh, Neisner attempt to break out of Brest and force the channel, come up the channel. Uh, and f in 1941, they'd been bombed, they'd been photographed, they had Spitfires had gone over them time after time. Uh, Ultra had intercepted the German message, the long ears of Ultra, uh, that they were going to one day, they'd try and kind of come out and so on and so forth. Uh, Galland, uh, <coughs> I call my friend, he is a friend of mine, I've known him for years and years, and a very fine chap he is, had been summoned to the Fuhrer's headquarters and put, although uh, he was the general of fighters, he had no operational command ever uh, 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 throughout the war. He was like an ins uh, what we have, like our inspector general, or uh, uh, the inspector general that was. I don't suppose he exists now, does he? No, no job for our chief marshal or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> and, but uh, he said, uh, and then they said to him, I think, Jean Eck, was it, the chief of the air staff or some such name, said, oh, Gal Gallant, you will be in charge of the fighter cover for this operation of the ships coming up and so on and so forth. So Gallant went down to uh, <coughs> uh, the Channel Coast, picked his men, uh, had, uh, I think he had about 250 ME-109s and so on and so forth, and he set himself up three headquarters, <laughs> one at Santo Maya, one at Schiphol as they moved up, uh, Schiphol or Schiphol, whatever you call it in Holland, and then one at Yeva. And he picked his controllers and so on and so forth, and he figured that they could have 16 109s over these great ships in daylight as they came up the channel and so on. And at some at certain times, as the 16 went out and the 16, to, there'd be 32 over uh, the ships for about uh, uh, 20 minutes or 15 minutes out of each hour. Uh, and it is inconceivable to me even after all these years, that these bloody great ships, really, I mean, they were big ships, uh, with their escorting 20, 40 e-boats coming out of Cherbourg and so on, nobody ever, not the whole of Coastal Command, the Royal Navy, the Royal Air Force, that's thing, in they steamed, and it was a man called Victor Beamish from Kenley, with his wing commander flying, was a man called Finlay Boyd, and the weather was very bad, the cloud base was uh, 400 feet and so on. He decided to go and sort of shoot up something, uh, they were called rhubarbs. You took two chaps, you went over and you sort of uh, uh, shot up any moving Frenchman you could see in France or so and so forth, <laughs> or somebody could take the bread. <laughs> and as they came back, as they, uh, uh, 10 minutes past 11 or something like that, and even then, uh, We'd, uh, Bomber Command had had forces standing by or earmarked for it. We'd had forces and that thing. And I think it was left to uh, six uh, uh, swordfish of 825 Squadron, the Fleet Air Arm, to take off from uh, Manston. They'd been more out of Manston, led by a very great chap called uh, uh, Lieutenant Commander Esmond. Uh, and they said that he would have uh, an escort of five squadrons of Spitfires 
They eventually left. Uh, they were supposed to rendezvous over Dover, and uh, he eventually set course from Dover at uh, 11.30 with half a dozen Spitfires, and, of course, all the swordfish were uh, uh, shot down. <coughs> I think there were one or two survivors, not very many. Esmond got a posthumous uh, victorious cross, and I think his body was uh, 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 later washed up uh, somewhere on the Medway. An example, gentlemen, there I'm, uh, of ineptitude, if ever there was one, on part of the British forces. Uh, uh, we can only excuse the army, they had nothing to do with it, but the Air Force and, and the Navy really sort of had their fingers well in on this occasion. A uh, brilliant bit of planning by the Germans and a brilliant bit of improvisation by Dolfo Galland and his hand-picked uh, 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 fighter pilots. Uh, Dieppe. Uh, I mentioned Dieppe. I, 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 I can't really. I, uh, it was picked by Mountbatten, uh, who was then uh, the chief of combined operations. <coughs> He'd had a, and they were looking for, I think his brief was raiding parties uh, to, uh, on the uh, uh, occupied coast. They'd had, I think, one fairly successful but expensive uh, raid on Saint-Nazaire where they'd uh, uh, stuffed an old uh, destroyer full of explosives and rammed it into the harbour. And then uh, they decided, uh, and all, everybody must make the, must take the blame for this, the chief of staff and everybody, uh, that they would attack uh, Dieppe in strength, and I think it was the 19th of August, 1942. Now... I had a Frenchman in my squad, and as we walked back from the briefing, uh, the night, uh, the day before we were to, the operation was to take place, he said, well, we have, my family has a country cottage at Dieppe, and he said, you, the beaches are, the cliffs are, go up to 150 to 200 feet all around Dieppe, uh, five miles either side. It's very rocky beach, or very pebbly beach, a narrow little beach, Oversea, he said there couldn't have been a worse place in the whole of the European coast to try and attack. And in we went, dear, uh, with 5,000, uh, I think 6,000 uh, uh, all told, and 5,000 Canadians. And of course, we had, I remember, uh, I had a Spitfire uh, 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 5, and I was a squadron commander at the time, and I got chased and harried by on the first uh, sortie of the day, by uh, uh, my squadron was split up, lost three people, uh, and uh, uh, I had a job to get out because the Fokov was superior in all respects to my Spitfire 5. And I thought, well, I don't know, how do I get away from this chap? And by this time, I'd got a bit of experience, so I thought, well, I'll spin the bugger down, you know, I'll stall it and spin it down, that sort of thing. So I spun down from, uh, I don't know, 8,000 feet and that sort of thing. I looked around there, he was coming down with me, you know, just a bit high, he was spinning down too. I kicked it out, and he kicked it out. And I turned around the bloody church tower as hard as I could, and, my, and he turned around, and so on and so forth. And the only way I could get rid of him was dive straight at the destroyers who fired at one and all, including, you know, the Royal Navy, no recognition and so on. And uh, <laughs> I never saw him after that. I don't think they got him, that's the thing. We lost that, uh, uh, a friend of mine, who I'll uh, talk about a bit later on, was flying that day. He was a group captain. I mentioned him already, Broadust. And he was flying. He was the group captain in operations at uh, uh, 11 Group. And uh, by which uh, Lee Mallory uh, was the AOC. And he called Lee Mallory up over the, after the first sortie. And he said, I think <coughs> that instead of going over in wings, sir, three squadrons, <coughs> he said, these Fock Wharfs and, and 109s are operating in twos and fours. He said, it'd be much better if we did that, if we operate. Uh, Lee Murray said, what did you say in Broadhurst? And because uh, Lee Murray, of course, is a big wing man, you know, the big formations and so on and so forth. So uh, Broadhurst got very, uh, 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 it didn't get any very, uh, change out of his AOC, who insisted we flew in wing formation the rest of the day. We lost 106 airplanes, 85 which were fighters. Uh, the Germans lost 48. I think, it was a, uh, I think it was the greatest loss we ever sustained greater than any in the uh, Battle of Britain. Uh, I uh, have a quote from the commander of one of the German artilleries. 
batteries that was firing down for on the Canadians. He said, we felt very sorry for the enemy. He was as a mouse going into a trap. Dear, a bad day uh, for us all. And uh, I think everybody, chief of staff included, uh, uh, must bear the responsibility of that. They've long since gone, so there we are. Uh, I just want to talk now a little about the tactical air forces. The Germans, as I've said, were so much ahead of us. And after Dunkirk, of course, the uh, <coughs> army were very suspicious uh, about what the Royal Air Force could do in the way of close support and that sort of thing. We were very suspicious about the army, whether they were going to stand and fight and sort of square up to them and whether they were going to bloody well sort of start running as hard as they could again. And the... And the, and the, uh, <laughs> the, 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 the feeling, the, not the feeling that... Uh, it's not the, quite the right word. The relationship between army and air force <coughs> was not good. Uh... Let me, in the desert, I was writing this stuff down, uh, which you will all have the opportunity of reading later on. <laughs> uh, since the Royal Air Force is <coughs> so suspicious about the Army's will to come to grips with Rommel's Africa Corps, a relationship, inter-service relationships in the Middle East were at a low ebb. And the army were pressing for the control of air forces in the field, <coughs> including the specific allotment of airplanes down to a divisional level. Uh, of course, this is, this is the very bad news to the air marshals who've always, since Trenchard's day, have always believed in centralised control and flexibility and not splitting your thing, uh, your uh, effort into penny packets. And eventually, the Prime Minister of the day, Winston Churchill, had to state in the House of Commons that the Royal Air Force was an independent service and as such was rem uh, would remain. Uh, Air Chief Marshal Sir Kenneth Cross, uh, who was a friend of mine, and I asked him when I was researching this, I said, what was it like when you went to the desert as a young wing commander. <coughs> and he said, and I quote him here, he said, when I started in the desert we had nothing. There was no understanding with the army, no organization, no central control, and no command structure, nothing. Uh, and because we did not have any uh, air force integration, uh, any uh, army air force integration, the army told the air force what to do. Uh, another Air Commodore uh, called Fenton, who was a, a, a friend of mine, retired, uh, didn't stay in the Air Force after the war, he said, in the early days, there was a complete lack of cooperation with the Army. And when we were retreating, I'm talking about the retreat to Alamein, <clears throat> we'd sometimes get a hundred Army officers calling my wing headquarters, asking if we knew what was going on and where were their headquarters. He said the British Army could fight all right, but it was not centrally controlled, centrally controlled, as was the Africa Corps under Rommel. It changed pretty radically under Montgomery. And when the New Zealander, he said, Cunningham, Air Vice Marshal, when the New Zealander, Mary Cunningham, took over the Desert Air Force in 1941, it was a semi-organised shambles. And uh, Cunningham sorted it out and got a bit of morale and decent administration into it. And he said the New Zealander was one of the first British airmen to comprehend the ebb and flow of the land battle, which we didn't know too much about, and to understand the, sol the soldiers' constant requirement for air support. Cunningham, Air Vice Marshal, Command of the Desert Air Force, said Bing Cross, like many of his contemporaries, was not a practical airman. We didn't have them in those days because they were all too old. They were all uh, first war gentlemen who uh, uh, we didn't have air vice marshals flying and commanding. And he had to, he was not a practical airman, he had to rely on others for tactical advice. But he was a political airman and it was his urging that the Desert Air Force and the Eighth Army 
formed a joint headquarters and lived alongside each other. And that was the great step forward. And uh, I think you had Conningham there, who was backed up uh, by Air Chief Marshal Tedder, who in 1942 was one step up. And then when you got the great retreat to Tobruk, uh, when Tobruk f uh, fell, and you got the great retreat when they drove the 8th Army back in 1942, right to Alabama, the 8th Army and everything would have been lost had it not have been for uh, Tedder and Cunningham, uh, who had, in those days, gentlemen, 1942, or towards the end of 42, November 42, had 96 squadrons at their disposal. You see, and they stopped. And I think only in that great retreat, when Tobruk fell and the Sur uh, Australians had to surrender, I think we only lost half a dozen uh, airmen, uh, sorry, soldiers, uh, on the 400-mile retreat because of the, uh, uh, of the great tactical air uh, 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 power uh, we uh, had then. And uh, <clears throat> I think that uh, I've got the day they flew 6,000 Desert Air Force in the first battle. It was January of 42. Uh, flew something like 6,000 uh, sorties with their 96 uh, squadrons. Uh, this was the time when Montgomery came on the scene uh, as the, 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 uh, the uh, uh, Eighth Army began to get a bit of decent equipment and the Desert Air Force was building up and so on. And he was, uh, I think, a rather fortunate general because he came at the right time as the equipment was coming through. And then, he, of course, uh, they, he broke out and uh, chased the Germans back. Uh, and in his uh, speeches, he was, uh, the bells rang, uh, you, uh, I remember it, uh, in this country, it was the first uh, victory we'd had, uh, El Alamein and so on. Uh, but he made, and he made a, came home and was uh, paraded up and down Whitehall and given this and that and that sort of thing and sort of told everybody how he'd done it. But he made no mention of the Air Force. And I think this uh, soured people uh, Sour the airmen for Tedder particularly and Cunningham uh, for a long time, a long time to come, as we shall see. And then Harry Broadhurst, uh, after El Alamein, he took over the Desert Air Force. The whole thing was restructured. Cunningham went up to become an air, air vice mar air marshal, commanding the what I think was called the Northwest uh, European Air Forces, and Broadhurst. Uh, became, at the age of 35 or 36, became an Air Vice Marshal. And he was the first man in 1940, end of 42, 43, he was the first practical Air Man to get command of a reasonable organisation or group. And that's what we've been lacking, because so far we'd had people like Lee Mallory, Sholto Douglas and that sort of thing, all fuddy-duddies, really. Nice old boys, but you could fool them. You could fool them. They weren't really practical men. And you got Broadhurst, who'd fought in the Battle of Britain, that sort of thing, and he'd send for you and look at you with his bloody black snapping eyes. You couldn't fool that guy because he'd done it. And Basil Embry and uh, the bombers had done it in two groups, and Don Bennett in the bomber command, the Pathfinders. There were only three uh, vice marshals who were the practical fighting men in 1943-44. So then Broadhurst turned around uh, when the, uh, what was left of the German Air Force had gone up to Tunisia and he found himself a, got, a, got, a, got a big air force and which had been uh, used to give in air support, air support, but not close air support. So he thought, well, what am I going to do with this big air force now, no air opposition? So he said, I tell you, well, let's see how good they are. And he got some old German equipment, old armoured cars, and he said, well, let's see you strafe them. And nobody, uh, you got the crack squadrons uh, in, I suppose they got their 20mm uh, cannon out there, bombs, that sort of thing. And nobody in the squadrons that he put down to strafe these things and bomb them hit the bloody uh, armoured cars. So he thought he ought to do something about that. And he turned the Desert Air Force into a close support organisation. And he introduced the cab rank. And that was the beginnings of the tactical air power that was uh, uh, going to uh, yield the great dividends in Normandy. And it was the same as the Luftwaffe had uh, devised in Spain in 1938 
and perfected in the Blitzkrieg in 1940, but perhaps a little more refined with uh, Rover David, cab ranks, uh, ground communications, people in the leading tanks and armoured cars. Harry Broadus, Mr Cabrank, he hates that even to this day. Uh, uh, and the difference between Broadust, and this is a lesson which I don't know whether it comes into your thinking today and that sort of thing. We always talked in those days about joint air ground operations. The GOC, the AOC. Well, the GOC was always of higher rank than the uh, airmen. And the army had to go in and, and win the ground when the Air Force had done whatever they were going to do. And so Cunningham always thought himself that he must be treated as an equal. And when he got into Normandy with three stars as an air marshal, you can't, and Montgomery was a four-star man and later a five-star man, it was, you can't be an equal, really. You can be partners. You can be partners. But the army were the senior partner in my day, and the Air Force were the junior partner, and they sat down, worked it out, but in the end, in those days, it was the army who had to go in, occupy the ground, and do the fighting. And I rather suspect it's the uh, 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 same today. And so, uh, when we got into uh, 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 Normandy, uh, this would give us a lot of trouble with Cunningham and Montgomery insisting on his equal uh, rights and uh, equal partnership. If I could just uh, briefly mention, and I've been talking, I see now, for 35 minutes without a whiskey and soda, but I won't have one to the end, uh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> if we can just now just have a look, what we were doing in fighter command when we were all, all this thing was going in the desert <coughs> and so on and so forth, and we'd had a, we got a hundred squadrons, a hundred fighter squadrons, of which I was commanding one in 1942 and 1943, and uh, when the 8th Air Force, the 8th American Air Force, came over and set itself up in 1942, we took them over to France. And as they stretched their legs and began to go into uh, uh, farther afield uh, against the advice of the British Air Marshals who said, no, you'll never bomb in daylight, you'll never do it. We tried to do it. And we had, because of our losses, to, to go to night bombing. And the Americans said, well, we'll try, we'll uh, see how it goes, and so on and so forth. One of the great sagas, thank you very much, sir. <laughs> One of the great sagas, gentlemen, in the story of air fighting, the story of the 8th Air Force fighting its way over Europe, unescorted. We would take them in our Spitfires, <coughs> which only had a range of 300 miles as far as the Dutch coast and that sort of thing. And in the... In 1943, they were going to Schweinfurt, if you remember, and Regensburg, unescorted, fighting their way in and out again, and that sort of thing, losing, I think it was on the 17th of August, 1943, one-fifth of the whole force uh, to the German fighter force, which had time to concentrate because they had the radars and they were doing two hours and so on and so forth. And uh, uh, one of their, uh, uh, Bender wrote a very fine book, uh, called the fall of the fortresses, and he said it seemed as if we were littering Germany with our dead. But they pressed on, the 8th Air Force. They pressed on and went on and kept at it until the Mustang came along, the most significant fighter aircraft of the Second War, and took them to Berlin and back and beyond and started the shuttle bombing when they went in and landed in Russia and down into Italy and shrank the world, the 8th Air Force, shrank the world. They really did with that bombing, their shuttle bombing, which perfectly harmonized with Bomber Command's uh, efforts at night. And we felt very badly about this because in our Spitfires uh, we could only go a third of the way of the Mustangs. And Portal, of course, who was the chief of the air staff at the time, uh, had been told that the Spitfire's range could be extended and he had even Winston Churchill had wrote to him and said, what are you doing about the Spitfire? Because Churchill knew that we were sitting on our asses doing nothing when the uh, Americans were losing a lot of people. And Churchill wrote to him and Portal wrote back and said that uh, long-range fighter will never have the performance 
of the short range interceptor and he was blinkered and may have been a very good chief of uh, the air staff but that was one of his Achilles heels and one which we met very much regretted. Leadership in the 8th Air Force, uh, no doubt about that. Great men, great generals, Hunter, Jimmy Doolittle, uh, uh, tremendous leaders, Kepner flying there, a major general, two-star, and young men like Blakesley, Zemke, uh, Gabraski, and so on and so forth. I remember Blakesley commanding the fourth fighting wing, and they had the old bloody thunderbolts, and that's the thing, and Kepner called him up, I said, you're going to get the Mustangs, Don. He said, uh, uh, how long do you want to learn to, uh, how long do you want to uh, become operational on them? He said, we'll become operational on the way to the target, General. <laughs> Good stuff. Good stuff. Do you mind? I'm getting quite hoarse, General. Work up this. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, we come to the invasion, not very exciting because we got the most complete air superiority, Normandy invasion. Uh, I was there uh, last, this year, because uh, uh, my Canadian wing, 144 wing, was the first wing to go back to France after Dunkirk, and we landed at a place called Saint-Croix-sur-Mer on, I think, the 10th of June to stay in France, which was quite, and we felt it at the time, we were back on the continent to stay after Dunkirk. It meant something to us, uh, uh, I'm sure. Uh, it certainly did to me, and it said more to the French and so on and so forth. And anyway, this year, uh, the French people, saint croix in is only a little hamlet of 500, and uh, without any bureaucracy or any local government or any uh, national government, under the local mayor, was a man called Jean-Pierre Abenamou. Uh, they... Uh, uh, had a little bit of granite, uh, Khan granite, and they said here, 144 wing landed on the 10th of May, on Milnerf, on Karen Carter, if you pronounce the, uh, the thing, and so on and so forth, to help uh, assist in the liberation of France and Europe. Very nice, very simple, so on and so forth. As an old man comes up, <coughs> he shakes hands with me, my age, 74 or something or other, and he says, uh, uh, I was here in the resistance when you landed and we spoke and so on and so forth. I said, uh, we'll take a glass together. Yes, he said, we'll have a glass. So we had a glass. And he limped away. Limped away. And I turned around to the mayor, Jean-Pierre Benamieu. I said, uh, Jean, was he, uh, was he wounded in the, uh, uh, with the resistance? Oh, no, he said, mon general. Oh, no. You see, he has a young wife. <laughs> We began to, and this I'm trying to sort of get to the theme of the story of the talk now. We've noticed that, <laughs> we noticed that when we were in Normandy, we didn't see the Commander-in-Chief, Cunningham. He uh, wasn't there. Every time Montgomery came round, he was accompanied by Broadust. So the four-star man, uh, the general, uh, had as his airman the two-star air vice marshal because he'd lost confidence in Conningham and he had confidence in Broadus. This was the general on the ground. And those of you who all know there was a lot of conniving and conspiracies as there has been indeed in this country in the last week or so and so on. But uh, there were, uh, the air marshals were uh, uh, cunning and didn't like uh, Montgomery and uh, was right in this and that sort of thing. And Tedder and then the poor old Lee Mallory, who got a bloody organisation which no one, <laughs> no one wanted, he was in the middle. But the point was really that because we, at the group captain wing commander level, we, noticed, we thought that it, it seemed that... Something was wrong because Broadust was always with the AOC, with Monty wherever he went, and not the Commander-in-Chief. And later on, as it turned out, it, uh, when one reads all the memoirs and so on, uh, Montgomery had lost confidence in Cunningham, uh, and Cunningham indeed, I think, had, 
uh, been a marvellous man in the desert, but he hadn't measured up to it as a commander-in-chief. And I went to see, he sent for me when he was uh, uh, later on, uh, when we uh, got as far as Brussels, and he wanted a couple of his uh, wing commanders uh, to go and lunch with him uh, to talk to him about tactics and so on and so forth. And so we went from our little tents in Belgium to the commander-in-chief's house in uh, Brussels, and he had a bloody great mansion, and a man uh, in a white uh, jacket met us at the distance of 1944, uh, in the uh, fall of 1944, and uh, we had uh, a tremendous lunch of Russian caviar and Cunningham there in his best uh, uniform and the Comte de Sanso and the Princess de Sanso uh, and, uh, 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 and the finest wines and so on. And it wasn't right. It, there was something wrong with it, which we sensed as wing commanders. And there was the bloody field marshal up the road and he's tent having his bit of bread and cheese. Uh, there was something wrong. It had gone to his head. He was socialising too much and so on and so forth, and he was explaining that his, uh, his uh, paintings uh, uh, in his mansion were Renoir and that sort of thing, and this was that sort of thing, which he actually, I don't know whether those of you may have read the book uh, on Cunningham by Vincent Orange. Is that well known here? At, uh, we have a New Zealander here, don't we? Yeah. Uh, and he uh, 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 glides over. And said there is uh, no evidence to, uh, although uh, Marshal Cunningham uh, had the reputation of being an acquirer, I think those were his words, there is no evidence that, uh, that he acquired of uh, objet d'art and so on. He should have gone to see the special branch, shouldn't he, at Scotland Yard. <laughs> That's where it is. It's on the file. And when Cunningham was uh, killed after the war, then the special branch went to Lady Cunningham's flat in London and remove those paintings and return them to Germany. A very bad story. It is, uh, 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 goes to show, a marvellous chap as AFC in the desert and uh, 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 somehow or other, leadership, integrity, had gone in the flesh pots. Uh, I'm about to uh, conclude, gentlemen, and then I am going to conclude. Uh, I think that the tactical air force is uh, came to their home in, Norm in Normandy. Uh, as we couldn't get at the Germans in the Bocage country. We didn't have the electronics you've got today uh, to find. We couldn't see them, and we were f uh, up against the most uh, 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 highly trained and best army in the world, that German 7th Army in Normandy, veteran uh, soldiers, more than a match for anything that uh, the British or the Americans, Canadians, could throw at them. And... Uh, it wasn't until they, we got out of the Bocage country into a place called Mortain, and I think it was on the 7th of August when Hitler uh, 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 ordered a counterattack against uh, uh, Bradley, who was the outstanding commanding uh, general in uh, Normandy, and he ordered a counterattack, and Ultra picked it up, and we were able to get the typhoons uh, uh, at the tanks, and uh, that was the beginning of the end for the Germans in Normandy. Falaise was the next step, of course, where uh, there's been several books written on where the, the gap should have been closed between Falaise and Argentan. It didn't matter whether the gap was closed or not. The, all the vehicles, all the equipment was destroyed there by tactical air power, which uh, had uh, uh, been born under Cunningham, really, in the desert, and uh, uh, brought to fruition... Uh, by Broadhurst, who was Broadhurst, really. Dowding was Mr. Fighter, Butch Irish was Mr. Bomber, Broadhurst was Mr. Tactical, did a lot for the Tactical Air Forces. Uh, I, I, thought, uh, I thought George Patton was... I don't, I, I don't think the British ever comprehended the ability of the Americans to uh, move as quickly as they could, their mobility and firepower. And I think we saw it uh, uh, this year when they moved the tactical air forces, the F-15s and F-16s, as you know, who were set up in the Gulf within 24 hours. And I, b I believe the division from Fort Bragg was also there within 24 hours. A marvellous 
bit of uh, improvisation uh, or planning, mobility, flexibility, which they had in Normandy and that sort of thing. And I think George Patton, he was a bullshitting, flamboyant, aggressive, pistols hanging on his bloody things, that sort of thing. Didn't I? I thought he was the most extraordinary thing I'd ever seen in my life. I saw him, you know, Barthel uniform and those old Monty and his bloody old battle dress with his bloody seat of his pants hanging out and so on and so forth. <laughs> <laughs> but by God, he moved and he got the third army going and so on and so forth. Swung him round, got him in there and that sort of thing. And actually, in the, he surprised everybody in the time when we were all bogged down, you know, the time of the Ardennes and that sort of thing, and he moved his whole army and counterattacked within 24, uh, moved them 70 miles and counterattacked. Uh, so what are we talking about? We've talked about leadership this evening. We've talked about... Uh, the men we had, the commanders we had, we come back, don't we, to the same thing. Integrity is, that is the greatest thing. And I think that uh, uh, the, the, in the Battle of Britain, if I could just go back to that for a second, I think the men we had there, the Milan of, of, from the old empire, the Commonwealth, I think they uh, responded to the leadership of Dowding uh, and I think everybody in fighter command in those days, uh, uh, the morale was so high, the men became bigger than their normal selves, gave more than their normal selves, and which was a, one of the greatest factors in the waging of that contest. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. So can I, can I kick off? Yes, by all means. And ask you about Cunningham, who um, you talked long about, and it interests me that the change that happened to Cunningham, from this great leader that he was, to this man who you said it went to his head, he, uh, he became interested in the, the, art, the art side and so on. Good living, good living. But why was that? I don't know. I what don't, happened I don't know. You'll be, I think you better ask a psychiatrist that. I mean, there he was, a man in a, lived in a tent and so on and so forth, had his mug of tea, was a admired and adored, if you like, by the squadron commanders, that's a first-class chap, and then he became uh, too social, if you like, or uh, in Europe. He actually had, he actually had a group captain up in the front, you know, moving about the front, to find him the nicest house to move into and so on and so forth. You know, that was the group captain's job when we all move forward, that sort of thing, so that uh, he would have a tactical... Uh, and uh, it was wrong, really, because uh, there was old Monty and his bloody uh, caravan and so on, munching away and his yeah. biscuit. <laughs> so, <laughs> I don't know. Every, uh, every man has his level, they say, yeah. do they? Yeah. Uh, so, uh, uh, and uh, uh, I, was, I was embarrassed when I was a young wing commander. Yes. I was summoned to his house, really. I, and I, I mean, we didn't live like that. And, yeah cut glass and silver and a lot of uh, waiters and flippity sort of bad and scraping and so on. I mean, he was almost set himself as a god, really. But was Cunningham unusual in, as a senior officer living like that in the Air Force? Were the other senior officers in the Air Force not living like that? Uh, I think we all, uh, well, I think, well, uh, let's put it this way. We always came back, didn't we? We were always behind the lines and so on and so forth, but... I, as a wing commander, had a caravan, yes. I had a wash basin in it. Uh, <laughs> uh, no, Broadust, uh, uh, he lived uh, uh, like the rest of us, really. He overdid it. He overdid it, really. Sir. It, was a, it, was a, it was a study, really, isn't it? I mean, I don't... I don't Vincent Orange's book... Uh, I, you, have you read it? Mm. Right. Well, Vincent Orange came to talk to us. Uh, when we had our Battle of Britain day, yeah. he spoke a lot about, uh, about Cunningham. Yes, in the, well, not in the Battle of Britain, about him in the desert, yes. really. Yes. He He's one of his heroes. He was a great fan of Cunningham. Pardon? He was obviously a great fan yeah. Uh, yeah. of Cunningham. And yes. it, as we, you know, we've said before, that uh, he, he probably glossed over some of the, the things that uh, you were saying, didn't even acknowledge them. His lack of a leadership is, uh, in the beachhead began to affect the operational efficiency of the second tactical air force. That's a bad thing, isn't it? Okay. Yes. Mm. 
At the group, Captain, Wing Commander level. No, they, they said it's not quite right. Did you have any contact with the uh, the Americans at that stage? Uh, people like Pete Casada, you know, who was uh, uh, looking after the... the uh, Ninth Air Force. The Ninth Air Force, yeah. No, no, Broadhurst said we didn't at our level. No. No, they, they were brought us. I think he was a two-star man, wasn't he? Yeah. Cassad, and a yeah. very good man, too. Yeah. No, but we didn't we didn't see much of him, no. no. I think the boundary lines were kept uh, pretty strict, really, because uh, of the recognition problems and so on. Mm. Sir, when you were supporting the army on their, on their ground, and how much did you really understand about what the army was trying to achieve, or were you just carrying out what you were told to do? Uh, <coughs> how much did we understand about what the army was trying to achieve? Uh, we didn't know. No, we didn't. Uh, we didn't understand. We didn't study them enough. I think this year, I walked down over the fillets gap, as I think, uh, over the land down there with Major General George Kitchen, who was commanding the Fourth uh, Canadian uh, Armoured Division. And Oberst Huber Mayer, who was the chief of staff of a uh, Panzer uh, 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 division, and uh, still a very alert chap, that sort of thing. And these two people were okay. All these years on, isn't it? Forty-six years on, we were supporting them. I was supporting them, and so on and so forth. And I didn't. When I said to Kitchen. I said, what sort of communications did you have with your battalion commanders, you know, were out or uh, whatever they call them in an armoured uh, division, uh, company commanders or whatever, out there on the tanks and so on and so forth? We said dispatch riders. And I said to the jam, what sort of, what sort of communications did you have with your pans? They said dispatch riders. Uh, we didn't understand their problems, really, I mean, uh, uh, of and the importance of ground and obstacles. I wish I'd, I wish I'd have realised that at the time, and maybe we'd have been a bit more efficient. Mm. So, I was very interested in hearing what you were saying about tactical air force and support of the uh, of the army, and, and the answer just there. Um, to relate it to today, I think we're probably still very much in the air force in the same sort of boat, largely, you know, not understanding the army's problem. And you spoke about close air support. We seem to be just about on the verge of giving up close air support as an air force role in supporting the army, because A, it's too difficult, and B, it's probably going to be done by helicopters. And well, I was going to say they'll do it themselves if you give it up, won't and, they? And do it themselves. Um, I'd be interested in your views about supporting the army and, and how important it, it was, and what you think about the future about the support of the army, or whether we're just going to throw over this whole role of tactical effort almost. Well, I think it'd be a great mistake if it did. I, 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 I think that, uh, I think tactical air, even in Normandy, I think was uh, one of the decisive uh, 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 factors of the winning of that. Was, uh, although the Germans, the German army beat us in the, uh, because of their skill in camouflage, in the Bocage country, we couldn't get at them. Once they'd moved out, we could see them and so mm. on. We could, and we could bring it to bear. Uh, I th I'm sorry. What was the? What, what, let's go back to the question well, again. It, it's this idea that because it's getting too difficult for us to do, rather like it was there with, with the camouflage, that we're going to give over the whole role to the army and not supply really a tactical air force. Not well, then, if you the want the army to have their own air force, I mean, if if, if you want, uh, then you that's the way to do it. <coughs> isn't it? They're going to get a good case for it. Really, I, I don't. What is the? What is the? Uh, uh, I, uh, what are the chiefs of staff now say? They, they, there was a limitation in my day that the army wouldn't fly anything over X thousand pounds. Uh, is that still? Does that still apply? It's, no, it's gone up and up all the time, sir. What is it now then? Yeah, who knows? I mean, it's probably around twelve thousand pounds or that way. I think that was about the sort of thing in my day, really. Yes. Four thousand pounds, I think. Yes, I think it'd be a very grave error if the air force they might have to do it on. Uh, but I would have thought that with your smart weapons and your accuracy and that sort of thing can't, surely. It's not the, it's it's not the, it's not the difficulty, difficulty. It's, it's the danger on the battlefield, the, air, the, the uh, ground to the 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 weapons that uh, the enemy yeah. will have nowadays is make the, the battlefield an untenable place, really. Yeah. 
didn't lie around for any length of time in a fixing aeroplane. Well, so it wasn't my day, really, <laughs> because well, we were lost a lot, lot of chaps, didn't we, to, I mean, the Germans were always... The 88 millimeter and the 30 and 40 millimeters was always very good. I mean, it's, I don't think uh, in, uh, in, in uh, the comparison, the thing is uh, a great deal of difference. Would you say? I don't know. I mean, I've, I've well, I mean, we lost a lot of typhoon pilots. They're still <coughs> digging them out at Normandy, aren't they? They went in, you know, uh, uh, on the close support. Mm. But the army's got to have close support. There's no doubt about that. And, and the closer, the better they like it. And if you don't do it, the air force don't. They'll do it themselves. But I think there's a difference that. The period that you're talking about, sir, the army had no pretensions to operating air power. No, no. You were the acknowledged masters of the air, and if you didn't do it, it wasn't done. Right. Now the argument has become slightly different, which is that it may be better for the army to do it, they would argue, or some of them would argue, they would find the, mm. A, they can do it, they have a capability or they could develop a capability to operate some air power, mm. but they would find the integration of the mm. close battle easier if they managed both aspects of it, i.e. the ground-to-ground -ground weapons and the ground-to-air weapons yeah. and the mm. air-to-ground weapons. Yeah. Yeah. It's not a question of danger, I don't think. I don't believe any Air Force uh, operator today is uh, afraid to do what is dangerous. It is a feeling that is shared on some occasions by both light blue and khaki that maybe the, the close battle is better operated by the army in its entirety. Then there's the other argument which says if we give up that role, we start to undermine our entire credibility. But that's another argument. Yeah. But in your day, there was no, no question no, of the right, army doing quite right, it. Quite right, quite right. They had no capability. But I mean, surely in Vietnam, they Cobras and the, uh, mm. the army, uh, I don't know what they call it, the army, it's not the army air corps, but, but the army sort of element. I mean, they had thousands of these bloody things given close support, didn't they, in Vietnam? Yes. And yes. lost yeah. a hell of a lot, too. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I think part of the problem now, sir, is that our, our assets are concentrated on very, very expensive aeroplanes. So 15, 20 million pounds a copy. It's almost become a cost effective exercise. Is, is it really cost effective? That's exactly what I said to Broadhurst when he came to see me in Normandy. And he said, Johnson, he said, he said, you don't seem very keen on this close support business. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, you're bloody right, Herr Vice Marshal Broadhurst. I said, I, I'm not very keen on it. I've been fighting for four years in the good clean air at 20,000 feet, and I don't want to be shot down by some bloody kraut with his... Uh, <laughs> with his... <laughs> <laughs> with these 20 millimeter thing with my valuable little Spitfire, do I? He didn't, uh, didn't think much of it, said he'd have been court martial or removed or something. <laughs> <laughs> so, can, can I ask you to uh, clarify something? I'm not sure I had always uh, understood from uh, reading of history books that uh, part of the problem with the breakout from the Normandy beaches was the fact that. Uh, the coordination between air and ground broke down and the lessons learned in the desert have been forgotten. Right, you're right. No, we didn't have any. You're right. About, yes, you're right. You've also suggested that uh, air power had a problem in, uh, in actually targeting uh, tanks and uh, ground units in the, the Bocage area. C can you just clarify where the balance of difficulty lay? I mean, was it coordination? Was it the country? Well, okay. Was it let's, let's take the first part. We had all this, we had Cunningham back from the desert, didn't we? The Air Marshal, we had Broadhurst, Mr. Cabrank, uh, who they'd done, they got the tactical air forces, all British out, they got all the lessons of air, ground, uh, liaison, requests, uh, Rover David, and so on and so forth. And for some extraordinary reason, when we, uh, these chaps all came back, <coughs> months beforehand, and so on and so forth, we didn't have a man on the ground calling me up in the air on D-Day or something other saying, could you come down here or could we have a bit of more support there? We had nothing. And we had nothing for, uh, I would say, two months until we got a control organization set up and were based in Normandy itself. Very bad, uh, it was a very bad admission there. Nothing at all. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, and the second part of your question was? It was just that 
I hadn't realised. Oh, in the barge. It's so difficult. Yes, we couldn't see them. No, the germ, the barge. I mean, normally is hedgerows, isn't it? Little orchards, hills, rolling hills, lush meadowland, and so on and so forth. And the Germans they, they were, were quite adept. I mean, uh, we had nobody on the ground to tell us what to do. That, and as that, the typhoons, very brave men. They had these rockets, six pound. Had, and it wasn't until the seventh of August, till the Panzers actually came out into the open country, that they were able to get at them and so on. And uh, 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 really, and then of course we we. I think we got down at one stage to providing close air support of within 30 yards of our forward troops or something like that. Gee. Only because we got a chap who squadron leader in a bloody tank, you know, in the leading tank and so on and so forth. So I'll give you a bit of red smoke, but, you know, put another 20 yards off the wing. <laughs> we got it, I think we got it right, really, uh, eventually. But the bit, uh, in the, it's quite surprising that it wasn't, uh, there was nothing in Normandy. Because in that first phase of that, Campaign. They tried to drag in bomber command, didn't they, into the close air support game, uh, almost. Couldn't, couldn't be done. And it was not a uh, success. Killed it? Canadians, Americans, yeah. Brits, didn't they? Poor yeah. chaps. And uh, I mean, uh, I, f I forget what it was. Operation Goodwood, or one of the army things, was it Epsom or something? Where, where the, the smoke from the uh, the marker, uh, the, 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 from the artillery guns, marking the, something for the artillery to do or the gunners was the same as the bloody Pathfinders, wasn't it? That sort of thing, when the old Leonard and his chaps coming in. And uh, they were we, uh, we couldn't have uh, Bomber Command, uh, they were uh, uh, not a close support. They were, they, were, they, were, they were weapons of mass destruction. Yes. That's all. And uh, I don't know whether you chaps have ever discussed among yourselves, you've got other things to think about. I mean, whether, whether the effort that went into the uh, strategic air forces, bomber command, and that sort of thing, could not have been uh, spent uh, better spent uh, elsewhere. Say in the tactical air forces, and as I said earlier in my talk this evening, the the German air force didn't have a tactical, uh, uh, didn't have a bomber command, but it conquered Europe, and had it have uh, uh, been controlled and directed properly, I think it could have conquered Britain without a strategic arm. So therefore, uh, did we waste? Uh, and put too much into uh, 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 of our resources into bomber command uh, uh, during World War Two. Interesting uh, topic. And I remember uh, the, uh, the strategic survey was written. Uh, bomber command strategic survey was written by Noble Franklin, mm. who's a chum of mine, and another man, <coughs> professor, somebody or other. Yeah. I don't know. Several volumes of it. And I remember <laughs> the, the, the <laughs> what. Webster? Webster? Webster, Webster was? Webster, Franklin. Something, yeah, it was Franklin and something. And this thing came out, and it came around the air staff, when I was a member of the air staff in 1956, and the chief of the air staff called us, all the directors and deputy directors together. He said, I'm circulating this uh, uh, survey because we can't release it as it is. It was too damning. It has got to be watered down because the relatives of the 57,000 people who were killed in yes. Bomber Command are going to have something to say about it. Yeah. Yeah. What Franklin and his uh, partner concluded was that uh, uh, a lot of the effort had been wasted. Mm. Was that because of the targeting then? Or was it just, just the effort that went into the bomb? <coughs> I don't know. I don't I mean, it's snag with the attack. There was nowhere to be attacked for that. Beg pardon? There was, no, there was nowhere to have a tactical air force <coughs> until North Oh, no, and Bomber Command was the only uh, uh, yeah, thing that kept the, the, the war, you know, day in, day out for six years. Yes, I, 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 yes, yes, yes. It was a difficult issue because, of course, the Germans and their aims were trying to achieve certain things, and we weren't trying to achieve the same sort of things. So, I mean, it's a difficult argument once you start saying that because the Germans relied on a tactical air force and they achieved so much, we could have achieved the same. The fact was our aims were very different to the Germans and what they were trying to do very quickly required a tactical air force. Uh, and our whole thinking had been very different to that anyway, but our aims were different. You know, mm. And whether we could have achieved those aims of a tactical air force is a very, very difficult position. Good point. Position. Yes, good, yeah. yes, yes. Very well, good where, point. where would the rhubarbs fit into that then? Would that be tactical or would that be strategic? The what? The rhubarbs. 
you know, going over uh, uh, low level, level on, the sweep, uh, on the sweep. So oh, about a tactical, I would have thought. Tactical. Yeah, I don't think so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In support. I mean, I mean, in a way, I mean, you know, it's this circular debate you get into it. It's tactical and strategic. But um, there is evidence as well, of course, that the strategic bombing did have effects. And the, uh, the United States Strategic Bombing Survey did argue some different cases to the British survey after the war. I think it's very difficult to... Uh, to, to uh, uh, and as airmen, probably we, uh, it was air power that bugged them, really, wasn't it? Yes. And, and uh, if you uh, try and divide that into the, uh, uh, the tact what the part the tactical air uh, power did and what part the uh, Gallen said, uh, I've often discussed it with him, he said, well, we couldn't move anything in Germany. We said, apart from, let alone the sort of uh, Normandy and so on and so forth, when he, I tried to get the fighter reinforcement, we couldn't move anything in Germany because of the bombing and so on and so forth. Uh, all, no, all, for my point today, tonight, was that uh, for the type of war the Germans had to wage, if their intention was to conquer Europe and Britain, they had the right sort of bloody air force to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Can, can I change the subject slightly? Yes, you're mm. the confidant, so you can do as you like. <laughs> well, no, I, I do not presume. Uh, but I'm just interested, you've talked about Cunningham, and uh, I think what you said about him tonight it illustrates very vividly that every man has his day and his time. And that if you take him out of his environment, and particularly if you promote him, he doesn't necessarily succeed in a different place, in a different time, in a different rank. And I think that's still true today. And that leads me to the thought to ask you to do something that, that was not part of your remit, which is to say that you were also a part of the post-war Air Force, as was your friend Harry Broadhurst. And how did the leadership challenges of peacetime grab you? How was it different, if it was different at all? And how did your post-war experience or how did your wartime experience help you in a post-war environment? Well, Broadhurst told uh, we saw met each other after the war, and he was demoted to an air commodore. You know, Mr. Tactical, if you like, really, uh, who didn't have too bad a career afterwards. Became our chief marshal uh, and so on. So I think the thing was, yes, uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it's two different equations, isn't it? Really, peacetime and peacetime and, uh, and wartime. Command and so on and so forth. I mean, you'll never get a. I mean, you, all everybody gets so old in bloody peacetime. By the time the war comes along, you know, stuffy dowding. You said nobody could, should, could command a squadron over the age of 26. He came up there, but I mean, they were all 40 when the war broke out, weren't they? And so on. It's very difficult to equate, isn't it? Really. Mm -hmm. I think uh, Broadhurst said to me, he said, never stay abroad as long as you can. Keep. Post it would get over and say, never come into the bloody air ministry, so they'll find you out. Robert Shaw quoted you as saying... Uh, Big pardon? Robert Shaw in his book, he quotes you as saying, why let a um, rank leave when ability can do it so much better? Um, was that talking about the, the wartime era? Was Robert Shaw? Yes, he, just, he, he quotes you, perhaps you've written in one of your books. I, I haven't come across the quote directly. Maybe he didn't even say it. Who's Robert Shaw? I'm sorry. He wrote a book on uh, fighter weapons and fighter tactics. Oh. It's a, fairly, it's a contemporary book. Yes. And uh, there's this one liner in there which says, uh, that you said anyway, why let rank lead when ability can do it better? Did you actually say I don't that? remember that, no. <laughs> no, no, no. It's in my BP, so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that's his essay. That's his major yeah, that's essay <laughs> for the course. <laughs> Oh, really? He's quoting Robert Shaw. He's quoting Robert Shaw. Well, he's got his bloody essay. Let's have a look at it. Have you got it with you? That was the only good bit in it. I got over that bit. Staying with the transitions, didn't you get bored after the war? No, not really, no. When I was the AOC of the Middle East, uh, uh, see, uh, and we had Aiden, and that's the thing. And I sent for the. Uh, I thought, what's the bloody airplane I want here, really, to get round the territories? And don't forget, we had squadrons in Kenya then, up in Bahrain. We were responsible for the South African High Commission territories, uh, Bekuanaland and Basuta Land and Swaziland. So you got a hell of. And we were training with the Rhodesian uh, Air Force who were coming up to us. 
So I thought, I want a bloody good airplane. Hunter's no good to me. I want a big airplane where I can put a bed in it, get my fishing tackle in it, my guns, and my ADC, and, you know, <laughs> tracker and so on and so forth. <laughs> in that order? In that order. So, uh, too bloody slow, wasn't it, really? Never get you there. <laughs> really. I got the Argosy, you see. I got the Argosy. And by this time, Mr. Broadust, Sir Harry, is the head of... Uh, the Hawker Sidley thing, building Argus's at uh, the Manchester place, Woodford. Yeah. So I wrote him a letter. I said, if I send my Argus over to you, Sir Harry, you know, all due respect and that sort of thing, could you please fit it up as only a, a two star Air Vice Marshal, commander of the Air Forces, Middle East, should have? Leave it to me, old boys. <laughs> 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 so we had this marvellous thing you now, which was carrying, instead of carrying 68 passengers, would only carry myself, my ADC, and one or two other privileged people. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's why I enjoyed the Air Force. <laughs> Except the, we had a chap called the financial advisor who'd come uh, in from time to time and say, yeah. you know, what is this, this airplane doing, you know, flying down here with only twice a week, you know, <coughs> testing the route or <laughs> the turbulence on this. <laughs> we managed. I enjoyed myself in the, uh, in the uh, really, in the, in the, in the, in the post war Air Force. And bomb and, and uh, uh, I was in the Korean War. And then I came back to Second Taff in 1950. We were just re-equipping because of the Russian threat. And there was uh, a work, again. I was working for Broader, so you have the don't you have the relationship and so on. And uh, uh, there was the Russian threat. So we got good airplanes, sabers replacing vampires and so on. Mm. Although I wanted to bomb a command, which was a new challenge. We had good airplanes there. In the 50s, the Vulcans and the Victors, the Vulcans particularly, and it was a challenge to fly those. And Christ, you go all around the world. Wouldn't take a fishing rod, go up to Goose Bay, up to the Eagle River. I mean, you couldn't beat it in those days, could you? If you were a multimillionaire, <laughs> eh? What about career, yeah. sir? Yeah. Uh, well, career. I was flying. I never got in combat in Korea. I was flying with the. Uh, uh, the thing called the B from uh, B-26s, F-80s, mm. shooting stars, napalm splashing. Uh, we were flying artillery, really. Mm. There was no. This was before the MiGs uh, uh, came into. Uh, before the MiG of 15s came in, uh, we were we were just an extension of the American Army. Mm. Rockets. Uh, were you there on exchange with the? I was on exchange. With the United States Air Force, or were well, you I was at, well, I was a place called Langley Field as an exchange <coughs> officer, and then when the Korea War started, uh, the uh, Tactical Air Command, which was based at Langley Field, sure. decided to send uh, a few officers out to Korea to bo uh, boost them up mm. with experience, and I was one of them. And I said, "Well, I'm an Air Force man, you know, Royal Air Force," and said, "You, uh, USF, as far as we can send, off you go, boy, you know." Great. So. Uh, 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 it was, uh, 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 I think, again, in Korea, I think, I think it was the, uh, the United States, I think it was the 8th Army, again, and the, and the United States 5th Air Force under a man called General Partridge. I think it had it not have been for tactical air power, they'd have been driven into the sea mm. at Busan, no doubt about it. Yeah. A, a slightly splinter question, if I may. When you were sent out there from Langley, did your government know you'd gone? No. That's what I thought. No. <laughs> no. But Jack Slesser, who's then the chief of the air staff, wrote, uh, wrote uh, a note to General uh, <coughs> Stratemeyer, who was commanding the air forces in the Far East Air Force, and that sort of thing. And uh, I, I mean, in those days, they didn't take any notice of governments, did they, really? Uh, and this was 1950. <laughs> No, no, they didn't. I mean, Slice of, uh, uh, and I, my orders were cut re report to General Stratemeyer, and he, Stratemeyer was a great friend of the British, and I think he was a bomber man, and so on and so forth. And he said, well, you're off to Korea, uh, Johnny, you know, Christian name to him. Well, him to me, not me to him. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, you better come and meet the uh, Commander-in-Chief, MacArthur. Uh, but we were too late to meet the great man. He was, uh, they'd stopped all the traffic for a mile each way and that sort of thing as uh, General MacArthur left his headquarters. You know, the, the yeah. A very underrated uh, man, I think, the MacArthur, great general in the, uh, 
in the Pacific, yeah. world, which we tend to uh, overlook when we're studying our. Uh, but the, you know, some of those marine assaults uh, are sort of tremendous. Yeah, sure. yeah. Yeah. You, you mentioned, sir, that the, the three um, of the, the RAF standing commanders of the war were products of the war, of the Second World War. Well, they, you know, was, I, I think for me, they were Bennett, weren't they? Well, I mean, uh, okay, there was Harris, and I never understood uh, uh, myself. I never understood how uh, Harris uh, 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 commanded Bomber Command. And, uh, I mean, people have written about, you know, the great one, absent, never, nobody ever saw him. It wasn't Harris, really. I mean, he, right, it was because these bloody station commanders and these bloody squadron commanders who got on with his directives, really. That was where the strength of Bomber Command lay. Mm -hmm. That's tremendous. But you had those very effective two stars. You, you talked about Air Vice Marshal Broadhurst and Air Vice Marshal Bennett in a group. And Basil Embry, yeah. But they were products of that war. Yes. They had grown up from... Squadron leader, junior squadron leader, flight lieutenant, yes. And gone rattling through the Run, system. Rattling through, yes. And how yes. do we get over that, that problem in the modern age? I don't know. You, you, that's, it's your problem. <laughs> <laughs> but you see, old Lee Mallory had come round and say, uh, I mean, all the the business of the ducks would wing and Barder and so on and so forth was that he didn't really know the AOC. And Barder would say, well, of course, you know, if I could have another couple of squadrons, so, well, 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 like all these chaps in the group and so on and so forth, you know. I, Lee Mallory didn't really say, well, of course, Douglas, you know, I'll think about it and so on. Go back and then ring him up and say, well, you know, have two squadrons tomorrow or another squad. He didn't, but Basil Embry, Bennett, Broadhurst knew. Cunningham didn't know. Cunningham had to, that's why he sent for me, to have lunch with him at the day in Brussels and so on, because he wanted to know what it was like doing this, that and the other. So is it, is it an ability to listen then? To know the right man to listen to? And be able to say, that sounds reasonable? I think we're talking about two different things. We're talking about war and peace, really, aren't we? And you can't... I don't think so. Plan for the I don't two. think so. But Commandant, what do you think? Uh, well, I, I, I know there's one more question. Right. Can I let Dave answer this question, and I'll come back to this. Do you want to... Yes, yeah, what, what is it? Well, I was going to ask at a slightly lower level, so... And you're... <laughs> 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 Not that low. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you very much. Sir. We're going to go a bit of ice. It's almost as good as last year. Sorry, no, I'll try Sorry, to go. At, the, uh, at the lower level, um, who, do you, who do you think, it's probably invidious to say, but in, in your opinion, who do you think was the best sort of wing leader uh, around in the early part of the war? Wing commander flying? I mean, uh, fighter leaders? Fighter leaders. Oh, I think Milan, really. South African. Good man. Mm. Uh, great chap. Should have had a Victoria Cross sailor. So they've given a bloody man, Nicholson, who said he got out of his airplane and on fire. Now, I ask you, you're all, you are all, aren't you, pilots, navigators, saying, if your engines, if your airplane's on fire, I mean, do you really, when you've stepped out, do you really get in again and sort of uh, hack somebody down? I don't, uh, that always left a bit of taste. Sailor Milan should have had a Victoria Cross for the Battle of Britain. Sir, can I follow that up? We've been wondering, I mean, it's not so much fighter command, because it was more contact, but certainly a bomb command. How did people get medals? I mean, how did such and such get the PFC? And, uh, how did what? How did they decide on who got the medals? Well, in the, in r roughly in the Battle of Britain, it was uh, uh, if you got five confirmed. Now, that might have gone back to the old ace system in the World War One, But five, if you got five, that you got the DFC, by and large. Or if you were a flight commander and done very well, and that's something you might have got away with three and a half. I mean, that's, I said that's for fighter. Do you know how they did it for bomber command in the middle of the night? How did they decide one bit of bravery over another bit of bravery? Well, I don't know, but I mean, they, 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 they. I mean, compared to us, uh, uh, we. I think I. I don't know how those chaps stood up to it really. Yeah. I think they were absolutely no, magnificent. I just wonder how they decided. On that. Don't know. Yeah. Don't I, I don't think there's an easy answer yeah. to that, um, except that I think we have to believe that in every case, those people who were cited for particular acts of bravery committed those acts. They were witnessed, and in general there was more than one person who could testify to those acts. Um, 
And that is how, I mean, even with the stress of battle and the, and the pace that, of, of events, somebody would come back and say, you know, what happened tonight, last night, you know, da di da di da And then people would say, hey, that needs recognition. And, and so it would filter through the system. And it did. Um, there certainly was, I think, the case of, of, you know, so many victories, so many ops, successful, yes, you know, uh, and we still do that. Uh, we still recognize, if you like, good service in the round, and we still also recognize particular acts uh, in peacetime. And one does that the same way in, the, in, in hostilities, I think. Stu, you asked a question. I was going to come back to that. Uh, the question of leadership in peace and war. Forgive me, sir. I, I, I was about no, to no, say no, thank no, you to you, no, but I just no. wanted to, to pick up this point. Can I recite a little poem before you... Please do. Yeah, no, go on. Yeah, 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 please, 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 please. Well, should we bow to each other or...? No, you go on. Go okay. on. Let um, me do this first, then yes. you cite your poem, then I'll yes, say thank you. Yes, yes. Um, leadership in peace and war is different, I think, and I was hoping that that would come out uh, markedly. Uh, the times bring the men, and that, that did come out. They're not the same men. And when hostilities occur, and when the Falklands occurred, people who were in high office got fired. They left if they were not up to snuff. And younger, better people who were more in touch and knew what was going on came to the fore. And it will always be so. The Gulf, if it comes to hostilities, when it comes to hostilities, either or, will bring its men. And they will not necessarily be the men who are leading now. And after the Gulf, the men who have led in the Gulf will not necessarily be successful post-Gulf. And I think history shows us that all along Absolutely. the line. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, quite right. Yeah, quite right. Uh, and, you know, we have to recognize <coughs> that. And we do. And there are people actually who step aside with a sigh of relief and say, this is not for me. I have not lived this life. And there are others who say, I've been waiting for this for an eon. Thank God. You know, I've got something to do to prove myself. And we won't know, I guarantee you, which is which until the time comes. And that's it. That's what separates us at the end of the day. So, yeah. sorry, a serious note, but I think yeah, it's yeah. worth saying. Oh, yes, no, uh, I'm quite right. Matt. I think that was, came through. I hope it came through anyway. That, Yes, it did. There are two different things, aren't there, really? The Air Marshal declined to talk very much about the Battle of Britain. And that was because, A, he knows that we've already had a look at that this year. <coughs> and secondly, because he's written a book. He's written a book. It's £12.99. <laughs> it's readily available for bookshops. Glorious Summer. Glorious Summer, yes. Right. yes. 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 Do you remember that? Right. It's not compulsory reading, but every purchase is a great flick. Tonight has been another in the series. Somebody said to me uh, in the last couple of days during final interview, Sir, we didn't have really enough on command and leadership. And I was bold enough to say that I've not been here all year, but I am aware that apart from the command and leadership phase, there has been a thread through the year, to which we have returned from time to time. And I believe none more valuable than occasions like this, when we have the privilege of listening to people who have done it for real, and who can talk from real experience of leadership under fire leadership under real pressure and I believe we've been extremely privileged tonight to have you back once again to talk of your experiences and to hear what you thought and felt as you went through uh, the days of the Second World War and and indeed a little bit afterwards thank you very much for taking the time uh, to come and be with us I am sure that all those who have been privileged to be here tonight will remember this evening for a very long time to come. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I also believe that you have provided an essential contribution to their understanding of leadership in action. And I thank you for that. Thank you, sir.